as we continue into the mark of a Christian, uh, we will venture into studies in ecclesiology, that is the study of the church, and in particular areas of Christian practice in regard to exhibiting the mark of a Christian. Uh, last week we clarified that the mark of a Christian is characterized in two things. First, it's characterized in the truth of the gospel message, specifically the truth of who God is and the person of Christ. And then secondly, it is, is, um, it is the love of Christians and all peoples. Now we highlighted uh, two verses in our discussion, John chapter 13 and 1 John 3. Uh, John chapter 13, uh, verse 34 through 35 says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. So that's the new commandment. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And then in 1 John 3.11, it says, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning. So this is an ongoing message that uh, we should love one another. Now, a, there's a little bit of context that's given in a previous chapter of 1 John. 1 John 2, 7 through 11 really kind of breaks this down for us. And so you can follow the wording. Uh, it's a little bit uh, peculiar, but uh, listen to what it says. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. So he's saying, yeah, it's an old commandment. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment uh, that I'm writing to you. And this is the important part right here, which is true in him and in you. Okay? Because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is uh, still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So this context uh, of the verse uh, kind of opens up for us. It clar this verse clarifies that the love is connected to not only the person of Christ, true in him, right? It gets that part. And then, but also, that is the feature of the gospel light uh, that has been given to us that in that portion and in you is specific there. It is the light that is coming from Christ from the, uh, that is shining in the world. And remember, Christ is the priest of the new order, the new order of a, a new covenant. Scripturally, you find it in uh, Hebrews chapter 7, where, where he fulfills uh, all of the previous covenant commandments. And this is the person of, of Christ uh, uh, under the covenant. He's the priest after the order of Melchizedek, if you remember that passage. And uh, he's the order of a new order of faith. Okay? So he's fulfilling that Old Testament covenant, but reinstating, if you will, uh, this new commandment. And the new commandment is the same one, really, continuing from the beginning. But it's further personified in the person of Christ. And so I think it's important that we remember that as we talk about the mark of a Christian, that the whole uh, idea of who Christ is in the context of this discussion is so important. Uh, it's something that we need to evaluate each time we discuss it. So, and here I would like to pause and clarify an important notion that Schaefer says uh, that the church needs in our era. Uh, Schaefer identifies elsewhere that church has a problem uh, in our time of having a view of spirituality that overemphasizes the emotional aspects of spirituality and downplays the mental aspects. As Schaefer said in his address in Lausanne Congress uh, in 1974, God saved the whole man. Okay, to clarify, God saves both the heart, uh, which the Jews called the seed of the emotions, and then also the mind. So there is a heartfelt as well as a mind-felt aspect to our spirituality. The mind is needed to understand truth, and the heart is needed to experience it. So both, uh, both of these really motivate each other. Uh, if you think about what drives us, you know, it, what drives our passions, if our passions are based in Christ, then it should drive us toward truth. If our passions are, are understanding truth and the, and the hunger for truth, it should automatically translate into love for our brothers. Uh, I think it's just a natural course of things, as, uh, how it should, it should be, uh, so, and how God has designed it. So Schaefer's uh, prescription for the church is not just revival, but, uh, and, and not just reformation, but really both. 
Uh, we need both an emotional stirring that's characterized by what we normally uh, typify with the word revival, and then the foundational depth of truth, which is speaking of the characterization that we associate with the Reformation. So revival and Reformation. You need both the heartfelt and the mindfelt, as I like to really, uh, I think that's been helpful to clarify. Now, as in this section, Schaefer really deals with kind of the core of where the, all of this uh, comes from. And we talked about it just a little bit in our first week, but really that we're image bearers. So Schaefer, more than most, constantly emphasizes that all people are created in the image of God. Uh, to Schaefer, this is a thought that carries so much weight for our world today, and is a, it's a point of common ground with all people, whether believer or non-believer. Uh, this means that the Bible gives intrinsic value to man. This requires that we both share with man the truth of his condition and the love and respect given by our Creator. We are to respect the truth of the created order. And uh, let me just share this quote with you. Uh, all men bear the image of God that have value, not because they are redeemed, but because they are God's creation and God's image. Uh, modern man who has rejected this has no clue as to who he is, and because of this he can find no value for himself or for other men. Hence he downgrades the value of other men and produces the horrible thing we face today, a sick culture in which men treat men as less than human, as machines, and as Christians, however, we know the value of man. I love that quote because it's, it really gets at the heart of it. The value of understanding being created in the image of God translates into an apologetic because of what, the, the, what mankind is, is not doing or not recognizing about himself and the way he relates to the regular world. Um, so this is really so important. Uh, we hear about a lot of causes about crusading for human rights. And yet uh, we can see that the Bible has taught the truth about this from the very beginning. Uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, the truth is the basis of Schaefer's apologetic and his significant answer for the current cultural crisis. So according to the liberal mindset, as he, as he says here, we are mere animals or biological machines. Okay, that's, that's a serious problem because the problem, however, is that animals are, are merely visceral and bent on self-preservation. And machines do not have emotion and do not know love. The animal machine does not understand art, beauty, or love properly. Yet mankind is constantly confronted with these propositions, and they consistently testify against him. That's what Schaefer calls the tension, is that the fact that he practices beauty or admires beauty without any basis for it. If he's just an animal, what basis does he have for that? And if he, he's something more than an animal, he knows this, that there's something more there, but he constantly puts himself in a lower position. And uh, is the slide up there with the, uh, the circles of existence? Schaefer shows this, and if you've been in one of my other classes, I tend to use this at least once in each class. So it, when, when finite sinful man attempts to put himself in the role of God and fails, he degrades his own existence in the process. So mankind tries to be God, he fails, and his own interpretation of what that looks like ends up being some sort of animal machine. In his, Dan, in what sense, if I can ask, in what sense mm -hmm. does Schaefer define attempting to put himself in the role of God? Yeah, it really, it's, um, it, what he, it's what he calls, um, let's see, false integration. Whereas that the person of God is, is in this upper story context, and so instead of God, God being held as who he is, he strips that of any content and then puts uh, himself in there or puts uh, some other thing that he idolizes in, in that spot. And then that false integration causes all sorts of turmoil because it's always impersonal. Uh, if you think of all the religions of the world, it, there's always, it's always impersonal. It's always uh, apt to, uh, to downgrade who he is as a person. And so, like, if you think of that, you know, if it's money, well, money's not going to do anything for you. If it's uh, worshiping uh, the Mother Earth, well, Mother Earth is, is insensitive. You know, it could care less. And the sun shines <laughs> brightly on, on the uh, just and the unjust. So it's this constant problem that of putting something up there and then removing it and putting something else up there, and it never quite works. So, yeah, that's, that's what he's getting at there. 
And so this tension is really a point of contact that we can have with the non-believers. We can begin to speak to him uh, based off this, just the tension, talking to him about his real world and kind of pushing him along that path. And it's really, Schaefer's method is sort of a reductio ad absurdum. It's where he's basic, it's called a negative apologetic, but uh, basically he, he takes their argument and argues their position to its natural end, basically just by asking them questions and letting them see and so like he's walking them to the cliff and saying, hey, take a look. And so, and then I don't want you to go there. I don't want you to go over this cliff. So let's, let's, let's try another alternative. Uh, they're just exploring this together. And it's a non-condescending type of way. It's truth, but presented in a loving way. So the next part that he wants to get into is, is kind of this detail of our observance of truth in the creator order. And it's, it's not this casual thing. Um, I think we've kind of solidified that because it's based on it in his apologetic, comes out in his apologetic. But it will cost us something to, to, to think this way. And I think this is a really important. It's a sacrifice to begin to think this way. Um, Schaefer says, All men are neighbors, and we are to love them as ourselves. We do, not, uh, we do this on the basis of creation, even if they are not redeemed or for all men have value because they are made in the image of God. Therefore, they are to be loved even at great cost. Uh, and we're going to talk about this in our discussion time, but it's, it's a really difficult thing at times to love people who, who are unlovely and uh, who do not respect God, um, and which you know they should, obviously. So furthermore, due to the condition of our culture, uh, we will feel this tension ourselves. Uh, it may be easier to love the like-minded follower of Christ than to love the unlovely, or simply uh, the one who disagrees with us. Uh, how often do we justify treating non-Christians badly or dismiss them merely because they are not Christians? Uh, it's very easy to take that step, isn't it? Schaefer says, when uh, Jesus gives the special command to love our uh, Christian brothers, it does not negate the other command. The two are not antithetical. When, uh, uh, we are not to choose between loving all men as ourselves and loving the Christian in a special way. The two commands reinforce each other. That's different, Mike. I think it's especially uh, <laughs> Yeah. Or polemics for that matter. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't mm -hmm. know. I guess it's a common question where I'm going to put it now, but it seems like it's sometimes uh, hard to know how to love people that are so whole such different. Um, their, their, their value system is so totally opposite to them. Yeah. Yeah. It, and it's, I think it's going to probably get worse, uh, potentially, you know. Uh, but if you think about it, the the time we look back to in history is the early church. You know, wow, they, they really seem to have it right. Yet, at the same time, you can see that they are, the contrast between what they believed and the Greek culture was huge, far more of a tension than what we are experiencing today. So as bad as we think it is, it could be worse. <laughs> if you consider the, the, those Christians who were alive during the time of Nero and the persecutions and those sort of things, how much more it was uh, of a problem for them. I mean, it's just uh, it was to constantly be demonstrating truth in the midst of persecution. And so this is what Christ has called us to, though. And I think, you know, we're a little bit comfortable uh, not being persecuted and not uh, experiencing that. So, yeah, but it is, it is a problem and it's a constant tension to, to... And sometimes there's a time for speaking very boldly and very plainly to our culture. Uh, it's obviously, there is a time for that, and that is a loving act. Yet, it must always be framed in a in a in a uh, point of view that's not prideful, and that's really the the tension. It's a hard issue. Part. Um, so, in the line of his his writing here, he goes into uh, this kind of exception. You know, he said, you know, is there a special honor to those who are of the Christian faith? 
Is there something special? And so he references Galatians 6.10. So, so then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who have the household of faith. Galatians 6.10. So this phrase, everyone, is sometimes translated all men. Uh, and, and so uh, we should understand that that's the context. And so it's to um, love everyone, but especially the household of faith. And very often, though, this verse has been interpreted as, well, you know, love everyone in, in a very general sense, and then, and then uh, you know, love Christians just a little bit more. So, but let's clarify. Is there a special honor? Yes. But again, not to the exclusion of others, yet also not to the minimal practice of love to fellow believers either. We should love believers above and beyond the way that we love everyone else. We should practice in the least a general love to everyone, loving them as ourselves. That's very sacrificial at that level. But then to an abundant level, an abundant love to our fellow Christians, the, and, and the biblical standard here is much higher. It has to be. If we are to demonstrate what Christ truly meant by that love, Now, how do we get here? What should uh, be the effect of this mode of thinking? Well, Schaefer says, uh, the dual goal should be our Christian mentality, the set of our minds. We should be consciously thinking about it and what it means in our one moment at a time lives. It should be the attitude that governs our outward observable actions. Okay, so did you catch that phrase, one moment at a time? It's no accident with Schaefer. Schaefer is not just proposing that we take note of the idea and, and think about it every so often. Uh, take mo uh, you know, note of the idea of truth and love, but that we really integrate it into a moment-by-moment -moment spirituality. What Schaefer is getting at by this moment-by-moment -moment Christianity is something that he teaches in his book, True Spirituality, namely that we are walking in a relationship with the whole Trinity. In each moment, and and both taking thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ, but also prayerfully acknowledging and petitioning his guidance and favor. This uh, really requires a prayerful attitude, a prayerful attitude of truth and love toward our fellow man, and especially our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's paramount. It has to be aided by the Holy Spirit. If it's not, it can't transpire in a real, true biblical sense. So how do we get there? We definitely have to start with moment-by-moment -moment prayer and really and truly walking with God. Otherwise, uh, we won't. And uh, it can't be done. Not properly. Now, Schaefer uh, wants to end this section really with talk about the two, two humanities. Um, if there's you know, any distinction left to be made. Schaefer wants to make sure that it's, that it's summed up, that it's taken care of. So he ends this section by mentioning in great detail the problems of our emphasis on two humanities as Christians. Again, it, it's a valid and truthful distinction. It is one that, for many Christians, makes Christianity merely an exclusive club with an innate attitude of looking down on the lost, a position which Schaefer properly characterizes as ugly. Schaefer says, very often the true Bible-believing Christian, in his emphasis on two humanities, one lost, one saved, one still standing in rebellion against God, and the other having returned to God through Christ, have given a picture of an exclusiveness which is ugly. For another quote from Schaefer on this, hence the exclusiveness of the existence of the two humanities is undergirded by the unity of all men, and Christians are not to love their believing brothers to the exclusion of their non-believing fellow men. We are to have the example of the Good Samaritan consciously in our minds at all times. So what does this look like? Well, what Schaefer mentions here in passing uh, is full of depth. The teaching of Jesus on the Good Samaritan How, uh, shows really Jesus getting to the heart of the principle when questions, questioned by the lawyer. Jesus dethrones legalism with two quick strokes. It's first the uh, obedience to truth, yes, but not just truth alone, it's, it's truth with a demonstration of sacrificial love. So let me read this entire passage. I think it's worthwhile here. Luke 10, 25-37. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, 
What shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave it to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. Now, if you're not moved by this passage, you should be. It's a hard heart that does not see the significance of what Jesus is teaching here. Uh, We must acknowledge that there is a unity of all men. Uh, Notice the person that he describes here, a Samaritan. He's not a Jew. He's a foreigner. Yet the, the people who are at the highest status in the Jewish uh, social makeup are the priest and the Levite, and yet they are the ones who pass by and do not show compassion. And they have religious reasons, obviously, but it's, it's, a tr- it's a horrible thing. It's ugly. We all live in the same condition, some more consistently than others. And, and uh, you know, if, if this is remembered, then we have uh, something to say to the non-believer. We can identify with them on their level. Moreover, perhaps we can identify with them. Moreover, perhaps with, with prayer, we will begin to see this and realize the character of the Good Samaritan and be of true service to him. Now, Schaefer starts the next section called A Delicate Balance. Arriving at this delicate balance really requires us to prayerfully analyze the teachings of Christ on this subject very closely to see also how the apostles applied it over and over. Uh, Here there's two verses that he uses in this section. It's very short. Uh, First, um, Mark 12, verses 30 through 31 And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And then also 1 Thessalonians 3, uh, verse 12, And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you. Now, the hope is, for all Christians, that they prayerfully love God and love each other with a demonstrable love, without the exclusion of love and concern for the watching world. Uh, Next week, we will take this step further as we elaborate on what uh, what the demonstration of truth must be and what quality of love really is required.